power in Washington is wielded in ways great and small. For every public photo op, there are countless meetings, phone calls, and conferences behind the scenes, where decisions are shaped that affect the lives of millions. Case in point, a recent conference at the National Academy of Sciences, there was no media there other than ANP, and on the surface, it appeared to be a mundane and uneventful scientific discussion on child nutrition. But in fact, the politics behind these PowerPoint presentations will emerge in some of the most vulnerable and chaotic locales in the country, school cafeterias. Every day during the school year, lunch is served to over 30 million students nationwide, and every five years, Congress and the Department of Agriculture reauthorized something called the National School Lunch Program. It's a chance to shape the eating habits of students, what they eat, and how much they eat. This year, the National School Lunch Program is set to be renewed once again, and a battle, which is fought every five years, is coming to another juncture. Kids today are so affected by what they eat. A third of kids are either overweight or obese. A quarter of kids, because their diets are so bad, already show early warning signs for heart disease and diabetes. They have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or high blood glucose. We are seeing diseases in children that used to only be seen in adults, like type 2 diabetes. They had to rename type 2 diabetes. They can't call it adult onset diabetes anymore because so many kids are affected. And this brings us back to our seemingly ordinary meeting. The USDA has asked the committee at the Institute of Medicine, part of the Academy of Sciences, to compile a list of evidence-based revisions to the school lunch program. As, as all of you know, that we really uh, need to be an evidence-based panel. And really Given all the politics around food, it's very difficult for USDA to come out with truly science-based standards without getting hassled by a lot of different food and beverage companies. And so USDA has punted this over to the Institute of Medicine. Lobbying a scientist is not the same as lobbying a politician. But obviously that doesn't mean industry lobbyists are waving a white flag. Who are you and who are you with and why are you here? I'm, uh, my name's Tom Crock. I'm with PepsiCo Food Service. I'm just here for information gathering to understand the trends and the needs of uh, what's happening next with the industry. Anytime there's a government-sponsored meeting that will affect national nutrition policy, you're going to have a lot of industry folks in the room because they have a lot at stake. The school lunch and breakfast program are $10 billion programs each year. And so companies want to sell their products. Which is why the man from Pepsi wasn't alone. Sitting behind members of the Institute of Medicine and among USDA officials were representatives with Sara Lee, Campbell Soup, the soy and dairy lobbies were there along with their respective law firms. The egg lobby sat near the bakers associations and food processors sat among HMOs. Porter Novelli, a PR firm for McDonald's, was just a few feet from Burnus Communications. The Grocers Manufacturers of America, a massive trade group which has lobbied to oppose efforts to remove junk food from schools, had multiple members in attendance. And the law firm Pal Tate, which used to represent cigarette giant R.J. Reynolds, was sitting next to its new client, the National Pork Board. This raises the question, does this look like a scientific conference? There is a trade group for almost every food category commodity you can think of. And many of these commodity groups are very influential and powerful. They have a lot of access in Washington. Access. Outside the meeting, in the public hallway, ANP overheard two lobbyists discussing their legislative strategy. A typical discussion for a lobbyist in Washington but one that is often unseen and unheard. The executive VP in our office is just very sharp and very, totally understands how to help, um, help assist with legislative effort. And he used to work for Mark King. Oh, okay. She used to be on his staff. She was a communication city communications person. So now she's on our staff, so I thought, well, I, I got it. Back 
in the room. The National Pork Board was finishing their presentation about why more pork products should be sold in schools. And in, in these recessionary times, pork products are a wise choice for budget-stretched schools. Despite a record year of rising commodity prices in 2008, pork prices rose less than 5 percent. The representatives from Pal Tate seemed happy with their new client, but they weren't happy to answer any questions. Hi, Stephen Greenshoot, American News. <laughs> So can I ask why the National Pork Board is at a scientific discussion about school nutrition? No, we have a meeting, so thank you. I had a fellow advocate say to me, she wished there were no politics that came into play when we talked about our children's health. And it's a very lovely idea, but when you're talking about billions of dollars worth of marketing, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of, of food, these are big businesses, and they're going to have an influence. The Institute of Medicine will issue its final list of revisions to the USDA later this year. With billions of dollars and millions of calories riding on the outcome, the movers and shakers in Washington may find that change is hard to swallow. Place on the food chain, you get to know your place on the food chain. I am